All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the January 2023. Hold on, letting more people in. Uh, to the January 2023 District 3 Community Meeting. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I hope you all had a nice, healthy, and safe uh, holiday season. Um, and it's uh, it's good to be back. Um, today, for uh, for at least uh, the first hour, we have a, a special guest with us. Uh, and it's been a while, I think, since he, he's been here. I think the last time we did it in person. So uh, that, that's how COVID is like I've said before, it's been this kind of blur. It feels like it's it was yesterday, but in, in, it's been three years practically. So um, so I want to welcome uh, California State Senator Ben Allen. Uh, he is your representative in the state Senate, uh, and he has been, uh, as always, a good friend to his entire district, including Redondo Beach. Um, and uh, and I would just say uh, I don't um, I have to give him a lot of credit because you know the decisions that are made you know in Sacramento are even more complicated than sometimes the decisions we're making here at the local level. Um, he has to represent a, a host of cities in his district uh, with a lot of people with varying and different opinions. Uh, and in some cases, clearly he's had to uh, make votes that maybe uh, people don't agree with. And I'm sure he can always explain uh, the complexities of that. Uh, but what I do know about him uh, as an individual and as he goes into the last four years of his final term here is that he is always uh, looking at both sides of, of any story, of any issue. He is really trying to get into the weeds and he's really trying to make the best decisions, not only for his uh, district residents, but for uh, the state of California and uh, and the progress that we need to continually make. So with that said, let me introduce uh, uh, State Senator Ben Allen, uh, and then, you know, we can open it up to questions. But Ben, why don't you, uh, you know, just kind of a give us an introduction, but also tell us a little bit about, you know, what you've been able to do in, you know, the past two terms, what you're really hoping to do in this next four years and or this particular legislative cycle. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christian. And good to see some good friends on here. Hi, hi Bob. This time we don't have to talk about uh commutes because we're all doing this from home but um uh Christian I want to let me just start with you I I first of all you know this town hall series that you've been doing over the over the uh, ever since you started in the council is so exemplary of your uh your 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 conscientiousness the the the, the, the your commitment to engaging the community in a transparent way uh, uh and um you know we're you you've, you've really put so much of your heart and soul into your work on the council and i know you're going to be missed and i just want to i know i know these jobs are not easy uh they're not glamorous you don't get uh thanked very often but i i, I do want to just thank you for your service to the city of redondo beach and to the whole region uh because some you know you got involved with regional efforts and uh, a lot of your work um uh, has, has has had a regional impact and your thoughtful conscientious approach to decision making has, has not gone unnoticed and so I know you're going to continue uh, in various uh, endeavors and I'm sure you'll find your way um, uh, you know, I'm sure you're going to continue in public service and I just want to thank you for your friendship and for your for our professional relationship and, and for all the work you've done for the community thank you so um you know, so with that, I I, uh, I wanted to take a, you know some time this morning and just have a chat with with everybody about some of the work that's been happening up in Sacramento. Uh, uh, it's it's been a it's been a strange time uh, for sure. We've had um, massive volatility in the market, which has led to massive volatility in the state budget. And part of how we had a situation last year where there was all this extra money and. Now this year things are going to be a lot tighter. Uh, you know the best. I mean, it's not perfect, but the best indicator of the health of the California budget is this is the market. Uh, you know, it, 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 at least from a from a top line perspective. There's some more complexity to it than that, uh, but particularly the tech sector, which has made so much money over the course of the pandemic. I mean, this is the great irony, right? We shut down the economy, the market hits record highs, we get a surplus, and now that the economy is getting going again. <laughs> All of a sudden, there's a contraction, but that has so much to do with the uniqueness of uh, the American economic system and California's special kind of dependence upon the tech sector uh, as a revenue, as a, as an economic driver. Certainly, that's centered in Silicon Valley, but it has you know, but it's but it's very much in in our area too. 
And uh, it's an interesting thing for us to reflect on as we look at you know, California's competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other, other, other states and other, other regions. Um, I've been serving for eight years now in the Senate. I was just reelected to my uh, third and final term on November 8th. So I can, we have 12 year term limits in the legislature. So you can serve for 12 years in either house. Uh, so actually, interestingly, in 2026, both, you know, Redondo Beach uh, will, will have, will be electing both a new assembly member because Al Marzucci will be termed out that year and, and a new senator. Uh, so, so watch that space. I'm sure there'll be, there'll be an, an interesting election coming up for both of those seats. Uh, I've I've spent my time in the legislature working on so many different things. I mean, obviously, constituent services has been a major priority. Uh, our office, our district office, is in, right in Redondo Beach on Artesia Boulevard, and we've got a, a fantastic team that's been working hard to assist our constituents every step of the way. In fact, Davis and Sam are on this call right now, and you know they're they're there. They can field some questions from you as well. Uh, but we've got a, a really a, 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 you know operation that that serves that seeks to serve constituents and. Um, that was something we prided ourselves on before the pandemic, and it became all the more essential during the pandemic as we fielded calls from people who were seeing their life, their lives flash before their eyes, uh, whether it was a small business owner who needed access to a, a, a loan to keep them floated uh, uh, you know, in, in the immediate wake of the, of the economic shutdown, uh, or, an, or a worker who had lost their job or gotten laid off, you know, trying to get access to unemployment insurance. Uh, all of those kinds of things, we, we help literally thousands and thousands of people get their, you know, make their way through those various challenges, and we continue to do so. And so I, I, I do want to, and maybe Davis or Sam can put up our, our district office contact information so folks can um, you know, just be aware. If you have any challenge associated with state government, we really want to help you. And, uh, and I would also say if there's a challenge that involves county or city or federal government, whatever it may be, we can, we can get you in touch with the appropriate people to help uh, with that as well. Um, on the legislative side, I've, I've had an interesting journey. I, I was first the, the chair of the Elections and Constitutional Amendments Committee. Uh, I've, I care deeply about good government and clean money issues. Uh, in fact, I actually you know, did the bill that created the new vote model, which wherever we have these vote centers. So people get sent the, their ballots by mail, but we also have these vote centers that are available for everyone to, work, to vote in for, I think, 11 days before Election Day, uh, anywhere in the county. And it's led to, it just made voting so much more convenient. This whole idea that you could only vote in one place on one day, on one, in one location between a set number of hours really didn't work well with, with a lot of working people's schedules. And, you know, I just love the fact that, I mean, I don't know, two, two elections ago, my wife and I were going to see a play downtown LA and we, we went, you know, we finally, we, that one day we had our kid was in being taken care of by someone else. So we just went across the street at the civic center and we were able to vote there, even though we live on the West side. So uh, this, the convenience of that has, has just been fantastic, and it's it's meant that people have really been able to participate, uh, and we've had really strong turnout in our region as a result. Uh, I've also been really focused on on transparency, clean money issues. I, I you know I've, I've you know I was elected right in the aftermath of the Citizens United decision, which really uh, made it more you know, made really really harmed reformers' efforts to try to clean up the political system. And I've worked very closely with Common Cause and League of Women Voters and. And um, and the California Clean Money Campaign uh, on on matters relating to trying to trying to make our system more transparent. And I'm proud that literally every every single session of the legislature, I've I've been number one, um, you know, number one in the Senate, sometimes tied for number one in the legislature uh, by the by the California Clean Money Campaign for my commitment to those kinds of transparency and good good government issues. Um, I then went to chair education committee. I'd been on the school board in Santa Monica, Malibu. Uh, you know, passionate about higher ed issues, access issues, trying to get funding for our schools. And one of the many things I've been working on is making sure that uh, there's a there's a you know equitable uh, uh, distribution of resources, including to our South Bay schools that have kind of been left by they weren't really being thought of in the formula that was devised several years before I got into the legislature. And so Al and I have been working on making sure that they that we that we raise the baseline funding for for all the schools in the in the state. And that we that we look at the formula so that um, that the districts like Redondo and others are not being left behind in the in the in this you know in you know in the analysis that's going going on with regards to to school funding, and and then since um, since my second term began, I've been the chair of the Environmental Quality Committee. And environmental issues have been near and dear to my heart since I was a young person. Uh, you know, grew up in the district. You love the beach. Love hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and down on the peninsula, I loved open space, and, and I've been working on, on on lots of different environmental issues, 
um, everything from some budget wins where we were able to get funding for the Palos Verdes, you know, uh, conservancy, uh, you know, down there to help with their land preservation efforts, some, some similar efforts up in the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, the Nature Center down on the hill, but also things like the Seaside Lagoon in, in Redondo and, and other types of, of, um, of supports for, for, for local projects and local land use. Um, on the macro level, I've been working on everything from climate. I mean, our, our, I chair our environmental quality committee that oversees the state's climate policy, but also uh, also uh, water and air quality, waste management, recycling, those kinds of issues. And, and some of you know that I was you know, the author of this big bill that, that seeks to dramatically reduce uh, single use plastic waste in our state and, and, and push industry toward more sustainable alternatives. And I'm happy to talk about that as well. We got a lot of big bills on climate done this last year as well. And my team was very involved in those efforts. Um, so I'm, I'm anyway, I, lots of lots going on. It's been it's been a lot of uh, it's been a fascinating job. Um, you know, really never a dull moment. Uh, and I think one of the challenges now is how do we ensure that we build upon the successes of the last few years while uh, while also recognizing that we've got some very serious budgetary constraints. Um, you know, I, from my perspective, we could, we, you know, I was actually part of a group that was pushing for more reserves uh, last year. I'm glad we got as many reserves as we did put into the rainy day fund. I think we should have gone further. Uh, I think we're feeling the effects of that now. Um, but I will say that we, we the, the reserves were record high. Uh, and I do want to, I, I think we have to continue to thank Jerry Brown for his, for, his, his foresight, uh, his understanding of how important it was and how the, the psychology of the government, the legislature sometimes lends itself to needing to do something like this, where you lock away money and you, and you put it, uh, you put it aside so that, um, uh, that, that because of how volatile our revenues are, uh, so that in a moment like this, we were able to access that money. I mean, the good news is that the governor's budget, I mean, there are some cuts in his proposal, but there's a lot of delayed funding. Um, he's doing some clawbacks, uh, but I think he's, 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 He's basically, you know, and he's basically sent a message out to the legislature that no new programs. I'm not going to sign anything that's going to create new uh, liabilities onto the budget. And, and we actually just got a memo yesterday from the pro tem, the president of the Senate, saying that we really need to do more. We're, the focus is really going to be on oversight, implementation. How do we make sure that the programs that we have approved over the past few years are being well implemented? Uh, and so we can have a maybe a more mature relationship with the governor. One of the challenges in the legislature has been this, um, I think, a reticence sometimes to provide our our constitutional uh, oversight role uh, and it's a it's a structural problem when 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 the governors of the same party and I, I think to some extent it exists in Washington but it's such a bigger part of the culture in Washington and I think we need to build that culture in Sacramento anyhow I'm I'm happy to um do, do you want me, should I I'm noticing some some questions are popping up I see some questions uh, popping up but why, and, uh, and, why? And before we actually before we do that I do want to I do want to mention these two events uh that that my staff have mentioned um, I mean, first of all, uh, there's this. Uh, we're going to be doing a a um, uh, a big uh, uh, homeless count. We're going to be doing a homeless count that's coming up, and um, it's going to be on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Perry Park. Uh, if folks are interested in helping with that effort, it's really important because it allows everybody. It allows the the county government and those folks that are again you know get are getting all this you know we've we've spent a ridiculous amount of money on homelessness I think you know for for good reasons I mean I think we all know we've got such a crisis on the streets uh, and one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we are able to count the number of homeless people uh, uh, you know on the streets so we have a much better understanding of how to distribute the resources and 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 how to do it in, in a way that is both reflective of the population but also you learn about what sort of conditions are on the streets and and I know that Redondo for example has been doing a lot of really good work in in both with homeless court work uh tiny homes uh, we just passed the care court bill which I I really do hope will provide uh, uh you know another level of both support but also a certain degree of um of necessary coercion uh for those people that are just so um incapacitated that they're not able to help themselves and that actually it's it's far less compassionate for them to be out on the street without uh without the supports that they need and i am hopeful that the care court will help with that and i'm also hopeful i'm, I'm involved with some legislation on these lines with uh, susan eggman and others to try to strengthen the conservatorship rules um, you know it's crazy that there i mean some people who are out there killing themselves on the streets who who are not able to get a conservatorship but they gave 
Britney Spears, the conservatorship. I mean, the, the rules are so screwed up, and and we but we we need to have um, we need to make sure that um, that for those people who that are that are that are truly incapacitated, that there's a a path you know, that, 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 that the 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 social service folks and the cities and the conservators are able to actually sometimes force them to get the support that they need uh, given the, the the situation on the streets. And it's a tough it's a tough balance to strike. And there's always a lot of debates and discussions with civil liberties people, but um, but a really important one. So if you want to be part of the solution on homelessness, a really great way to help is to be a part of this um, uh, of of uh, you know of, of this of this homeless of this homeless count um so that's that's that I mean we're, we're working on so many bills I mean we're going to be doing some additional work on extending producer responsibility on a whole variety of projects and products from EV batteries and household hazardous waste and some additional work on the plastics issues we're we're do, looking to do a bill for those new drivers between 18 and 21 to require lessons one of the problems you know, if you get your license before 18 um, there's a really rather robust uh, education driver education program, but we're actually finding that for those people who wait until after they're 18, they don't have any requirements along those lines, and yet they're oftentimes very underprepared, uh, and and they and they need they need they need some more support. You see a lot of accidents from from younger people who have just gotten their licenses and don't have the kind of driver education requirements for, that that are that are uh, imposed upon those uh, who are a little younger. So we're working on that. I mean, it's a it's a long variety of bills, but. Um, happy to start taking questions or however you want to do it Christian sure sure so uh you, first of all thank you uh for continuing to pursue the conservatorship uh, angle I know that myself and city attorney Webb's office has you know been trying to talk with you guys for a few years about that and you've been trying to thread that needle as it relates to civil liberties and whatnot so I, I'm glad to hear that you, you guys are still you know focusing on that um so uh before we go to questions uh you, you just kind of threw out a, a handful of uh things but is there anything that you are anticipating happening in this legislative session uh uh, you know anything that you primarily want to focus on that that will have impacts here on uh, the South Bay directly, or uh, and then do you want to touch base a little bit on uh, housing? Because I know I've got an email here with housing questions for you, and and that's been clearly uh, you know uh, yeah. a year over year concern with you know the fact that Sacramento. Uh, is taking a bit more of a heavy hand in, yeah. in the housing arena, and you know people are uh you know they're 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 nervous they're they're feeling the pinch i think there's people who uh who want to do more and and know that we need to do more but they're they're also torn with the fact that it's going to change the the landscape of where they live and whatnot so yeah no it's a great question and it's and it's and it's it's a very tricky question i mean i i um you know the i think well let's start by saying that um i think what's motivating the people who are pushing for housing reforms is a a, 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 a you know a, a strong sense that's actually you know pretty grounded in data that that housing costs are out of control that it's become a, a, a real massive problem with regards to quality of life and economic competitiveness and our, and our ability for younger people to afford a home we hear from business leaders all the time that uh, that you know one of the actually the big challenges we're a very high cost state and a lot of that's driven by our housing costs and so and there's a lot of young people especially who are not able to afford the communities to live in the communities where they grew up even though even if they have you know good well-paying jobs and it's because of how uh, how little supply there is out there and the cost and how high the costs have risen now um so that's I think so so what's motivating you know folks like California Yimby and uh you know the president pro tem of the Senate and 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 Scott Weiner and Buffy Wicks I mean some of the folks up 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 in Sacramento who've been really pushing the housing agenda I think is this is this idea that we need more supply and the challenge I think and it's interesting that a couple of them actually came out of local government themselves and I think Scott has you know taken the position that 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 as much as you'd like to just hand over these decisions to the locals the locals are always going to find a way there's, there's too much political pressure to not allow for more housing because people just don't you know they, they always want to have housing somewhere else they want don't want to have it near them this is the mentality um you know it's my I I mean I I you know I it's my strong sense that we can and need to grow um but we we but we ought to be able to do it in a much more um place sensitive way 
you know that there are that there are certain parts of town let's say downtown LA for example that are truly transit rich truly job rich that are built for that, that the mentality is is built for density uh, and there are some other parts of town that are like this as well and that that there's opportunities for growth of course and you're starting to see I mean every, you know, if anyone's been downtown recently you see lots of cranes and lots of apartment towers going up and that's all a good thing right that, I mean here we are this is a people it's a dense area it's got the infrastructure for that kind of density and of course you know I think we got to make the streets a little safer and make the transit system safer I mean those are all part of that story too by the way um my concern with some of the legislation that's been coming out of Sacramento is that it, it is a little too one size fits all it just imposes the same standards on everybody uh in spite of the fact that um you know the different towns are different and that actually we wouldn't want to promote that kind of density that you have in a place like downtown LA in other parts of the South Bay for example sometimes which are very far from freeways very far from transit that quite frankly would only promote more traffic um more more sprawl uh and and I, so I that's my that's that's my continual concern with the uh with with some of the legislation that's been coming down and there's I, so I've said this to the contract cities I actually you know, gave a big talk to them uh, the other day when they came up to Sacramento and we were talking about how cities need to start to play a much more proactive role in helping to be part of the solution you know I think part of the reason why the legislature my my son's here he's uh <laughs> he's very excited um you know part of the reason why the legislature has has been in this place where um you know where 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 they're where they're imposing these these new rules is because they see the cities as just being impediments to progress on housing and if we can get cities to be more part of the discussion and maybe more part of regional solutions so it's not to impose a you know a city by city imposition but but more regional solutions so that, that the regions can get together and figure out together maybe at the county level where it's most appropriate to have growth there's some areas that have much more of the infrastructure for growth than others uh, and that goes everything from I mentioned transit, but it also goes to schools and water and everything else. Uh, and 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 then we can all fund, we can all work together to to allow for that growth in those areas where it's most appropriate. You know, it's part of why we did the South Bay Housing Trust that we worked on together with the city of Redondo and a couple of those cities in the South Bay. It's a bill that I did just last year that will allow the South Bay cities to pool resources a little bit more so as to provide for more uh, affordable housing and, and, and more housing. You know, but 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 doing it on, on on the city's terms, recognizing the need for more housing, but doing so in a way that is more respectful of local needs and conditions. Okay, um, I'm going to read a question from uh, from Holly, who is on the call, but she she sent me an email. So uh, let me just see. Um, okay, this question is in regard to the housing element and the builder's remedy. Uh, as you know, for Skag cities, which are in your reason our housing elements were due October 2021, which is still being considered on time if it was in by February of 2022. However, only six or seven of the 197 region cities in the Skag area met the deadline due to the rule changes while the elements were being written. Uh, the situation was so bad, Assembly Member Bloom passed some sort of emergency measure signed by the governor at the end of June, extending the date to October 2022. Um, Hold on, I'm trying to find out where the question is here. Uh, do, do, do. But she's saying we were really not extended completely and developers are claiming that because we did not have a housing element in much of 2022, they get to do whatever they want using the builder's remedy. 16 projects were applied for while Santa Monica was waiting for their element to get released and 15 of them by one developer. So she's kind of getting to the point of these seem like devious practices uh and what makes people not trust hcd or the legislature um are you uh able to get some sort of emergency legislation passed again such as assembly member bloom did suspending the builder's remedy for either skag or all cities uh in the next couple of years uh thoughts yeah i have it on mute because my that's my okay i'm <laughs> doing his bat bot back here um, so I, I am I am definitely aware of this. I'm 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 you know I'm a Santa Monica resident, and this really um, took the city pretty you know they they got pretty um, hit by this. Uh, this is an interesting kind of confluence of this builder's remedy was legislation from decades ago that um, uh, 
they, 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 a lot of, I think a lot of cities were just not paying enough attention to. Uh, they were trying to, you know, they were trying to rethink their land elements when they were, um, you know, so as to so as to deal with some of this new legislation, and uh, and as a result, they got stuck in the situation where now they're kind of caught, and and these you know these builders are now you know, asserting this builder's remedy right against them. So I'm definitely, I, I, but we'll I will definitely go check out. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in in some sort of extension along the lines of what Richard was working on. I know that you know one of the challenges we have is that uh, that the, the housing committee chairs are you know um, pretty doctrinaire, but or they're very much on the you know the build baby build side. Uh, and so, but I think that there's I think that there's a way for us to talk to them about some of the unique circumstances and just and especially if we can figure out a way to 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 show support on the part of uh, of you know, to, to show some good faith efforts on the part of the city to meet some of their other housing goals that there would be a willingness on their part to accept some sort of extension idea so i'll, I'll talk to them about that i think it's a good idea uh I, you know i i, I think that it, it it was a i think i think that you're absolutely right that these that these guys are are basically taking advantage of of another um uh of, of another uh you know they're, they're taking advantage of 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 this tool that now exists in the law and i you know and this was something i think the cities were not adequately aware of because they would have you know they would have gotten their plans in earlier um but but it had been it had been in law for for 20 30 years it hadn't been used uh but now of course the rules have changed with regards to the elements um the land use elements and so um that confluence led to the situation so I, I'll, I'll definitely I'll reach out to Richard's office. So, sorry to Richard. I guess he's not in the office anymore. Um, and I'll talk to him a little about it. And some of his staff, some of his staff are actually still working. And I think I think actually the staffer that worked uh, uh, on that on that bill last year uh, is is now is still in the assembly. So we can. I, I'd like to actually do something similar along those lines. I like that idea. Um, we'll we'll spend a little time on that. And I'll, and I'll, I can be in touch with you, Christian, or or whoever else was the person who asked you the question, so as to make sure that we're. As we work on it, we're 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 doing it in a way that will be helpful to Redondo. Okay, and and Holly, I would just recommend you can send that same email you sent to me to uh, Davis's email address, which is in the uh, chat, or uh, Senator Allen's email address, which is yeah, that that was my idea as well. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Um, before I go to the chat questions, uh, are there any questions, uh, concerns from anybody uh, that's on the call? Just to either wave your hand wildly or or click uh, on reactions and raise hand. Uh, Bob. Thanks. And thanks um, to both Ben and Christian for, for your service. Uh, ben, since you mentioned about um, better driver education for younger folks, I, one of the things that peppers social media nowadays and and it's a true concern is um, kids who are using electric bikes as like motor vehicles without any regard for uh the rules of the road in terms of stopping at stop signs and uh all of those kinds of things and i wonder if there's anything if you've given any thought or if there's anything percolating in the legislature both for either licensing or increased education for um, people who are underage who are using what essentially are becoming motor vehicles. Thanks. Yeah, but then I, I will, let me second Bob's thing there, right? It, it, the speeds that electric bikes can reach are no different than mopeds, right? Which require a license. And so it, this has been a, even a conversation locally at the city council, like at what point does the state kind of recognize that, okay, we have this new technology, yeah. It's it's threading you know this this fine line between being you know uh, micro mobility you know just regular bike but it has the power to go fast and and really we are seeing uh, young kids who are probably getting these as gifts from their parents right to help them get around but they're using them in irresponsible manner so uh, it does create issues thoughts yeah I so this is actually something I ended up in a long conversation with several people in Redon in Hermosa Beach and I know that. Um, that their police chief there is working on this. We're actually trying to get a meeting with the with the chair of the transportation committee, Lena Gonzalez, because I because it turns out that his brother, I think, is on the Long Beach PD and is working on this down in Long Beach too, because this has become an enormous problem. Just just e 
e-bike and scooter safety in general. I mean, there's been there have been accidents, there have been a lot of really scary near misses. And it's just a little chaotic because the the road the road rules have not moved quickly enough to reflect the uh the changing conditions with all these um with all these all this technology that's now on the streets that didn't, you know, that just didn't um that wasn't out there before. So um there, so we're working on, and I, I, I can't give you too much detail right now because we're trying to figure out this conversation is going on with the transportation committee. Um, obviously, you know they're 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 talking to a lot of different stakeholders, but I'm really glad to hear that. I, I, do you know Christian if if you've been in if, if you've been in touch with the Hermosa people about this or because no okay no I haven't I just I just made a comment at a, a recent discussion I mean it was you know maybe in November or December at City Council that a lot of the things that we would want to do to effectuate safety we actually needed to come from the state level right you know we can only do so much here but we're we're beholden to you know state vehicle code regulations and whatnot and so uh so i said we should start petitioning to bob's point you know our legislators about like hey what can we do to improve the overall safety and another thing i'll i'll throw out there and and bob may agree with this as well as a, a you know a, a micro mobility advocate and transit advocate the MUTCD, you know, the the code that the the vehicle code that public works people use, you know, when they're considering putting in dedicated bike lanes or whatnot, seems to be create more limitations for localities to do things that create a an honest and true separation between vehicular traffic and say micro mobility traffic. You know, when we're doing this, uh, you know, local travel network, which I'm sure Jackie Bacharach has talked about, but that's still using more of a, uh, uh, you know, you're sharing the road in residential areas. Um, you know, I'm of the mind that if we are able to build dedicated lanes without necessarily totally killing the vehicular, uh, traffic area that we're going to actually see more people choosing to get around in safe manners and if you know people had dedicated bike lanes or whatnot i think you know some of these issues would go away but again the problem is you know state uh, the the state vehicle code and and stuff that public works department rely on doesn't necessarily allow them to put a uh, a class two bike lane on the inside of a parked car they have to put it on the outside, right? And it, it doesn't make sense because now you have car, parked car, bike lane, vehicular traffic, right? And whereas you could have a, a, a parked car acting as a, a natural barrier between you and, and that, you know, that lane. So I, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went a little over, you know. No, I mean, that's that's good to hear too. I, I um, you know what, let's, why, why don't we, why don't we get you involved in this, um, this little, this dialogue that's happening between Long Beach and, and Hermosa Okay. Uh, uh, you know, and, and your perspective would be super helpful because we're trying to figure out some sort of legislative path just to just to just to deal with these safety issues. I mean, the police, I know I, I'm sure this is an issue you're dealing with, too, because the police chief in Hermosa is just so concerned about this. I mean, they've had a bunch of people who've been hit uh, and a lot of really scary near misses. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I'd love to get you involved. I, I, I'm glad to hear that you're into this topic, and then we can also, maybe coming out of that discussion, we can talk about some of these, um, so some of these other issues that you've been talking about in terms of, in terms of the, 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 the you know, the regulations that that impact the creation of bike lanes on the streets, and, um, so I, so let's let's get you involved with that effort. They're 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 in a dialogue right now, and we're trying to formulate a, a legislative proposal, basically. Okay. Um. So. We'll get you involved and in, in, maybe Bob, you can help, you can be, uh, excuse me, we can help uh, be Christian's advisor on it. <laughs> good, uh, Bob, are you good or any other question, follow up or no? No, thanks, uh, no, thanks, thanks for the response. I, I greatly appreciate it. I, it um, yeah, it's just, it's just a problem when one navigates through the streets, there's so many more obstacles and uh, hazards that we didn't have uh before yeah so yeah no totally i mean and the thing is it's a it's a if it, it you know there's so much benefit associated with these technologies and yet uh if they're because our system doesn't really isn't really built for them they can end up really harming a lot of people and i, I you know and i just i saw i guess like peter's thing just popped up on my screen saying 
he got hit on his way to Hermosa Pier. Well, shoot, there you go. So my gosh. Um, yeah, so let's let's I will get I will get you involved with this dialogue with Hermosa Christian, Hermosa okay. Long Beach, and we'll and we'll we're, we're gonna we're gonna try to pull something smart together. All right. Any other questions from the audience before we go to the chat questions? All right, seeing none, then we'll start at the top here. Uh, Jeff asks about uh, water conservation capacity. What's the cost to say double our LA County rainwater storm drain capacity? Uh, thought I heard something about one year of water for uh, 800,000 residents in LA County. Um, I I know we're, we're we're continuing to try and capture more and more, uh, you know, stormwater runoff uh, be, and prevent it from going into the sea. But Ben, are you guys, uh, you know, working on anything uh, specific? Yeah, that? I mean, we captured something like two billion gallons during the most recent storms in the county, uh, and that's that's you know that's enough for eight hundred thousand people in one year. So that that's a lot of water. Um, and we had, of course, we had measure um, measure W. That's raising something like three hundred dollars, um, three hundred million, um, three hundred million dollars per year uh, for rainwater recycling. Uh, so we're working on it. I mean, some of the projects have already been completed. You know, the timeline is pretty extended given how old our water infrastructure is, and and you know, historically our rivers and streams were redirected and channeled to prevent flooding above all else. So this is the interesting thing, right? The system from before when we had so you know back in the '30s and the '20s during these great public works projects. It was all there'd been some terrible flooding and there's actually terrible stories of much of the uh, the river valley of both San Gabriel and in La, and Los Angeles rivers being uh, flooded pretty extensively. And so the, the you know, the, the 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 Army Corps of Engineers came in and just built these levees and it was all about flushing the water as fast as you could down into the ocean. And that was at a time when we were so many fewer people in the state and we we obviously didn't have any of the kinds of water uh, needs that we have today. So that's part of the challenge here is redirecting our thoughts about the infrastructure and really focusing more on, on rainwater, stormwater capture. Uh, so these pro that's now the stormwater capture is at the heart of Measure W. Uh, there's also statewide efforts that are happening along these lines. I mean, they're trying to build reservoirs now that are, that, that are, that are off the side of our major rivers so that during times of massive overflow, they can direct the water into the reservoirs, recharge those reservoirs, and you you basically just open the gates for those reservoirs when um, when when there's times of um, uh, when when, you know, when when there's a lot of excess water such as now so up in Northern California for for example there's the Sites Reservoir that's that's been that's that's underway so you know it's it's a um, it's a it's a it's going to be a long process right I mean it's it's ultimately um, you know I mean of course you know and I will say some people say oh a lot it's just about building more dams you know that's a lot of, of folks call for. Uh, but, um, you know, but, uh, but, but that's not always the answer either. I mean, the dam certainly, they harm a lot of the, the environment. Um, you know, I think that this, this, this other model of creating off flow reservoirs that, 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 so that you can run the water off of the river. So the rivers, the river flow itself isn't getting, isn't getting blocked, but you have a side reservoir that, that captures the water during moments of, of excess water. That's a better, that's a better approach. I mean, we often, um, uh, you know, yeah. So, so that that so anyway, there, there's a lot of work underway and a lot more to come. But but definitely, if you're interested in this topic, go take a look at all the all the resources that are already being directed this way under Measure W, which was a really important reform for Los Angeles. All right, uh, Peter asks, uh, and I think you you touched on this at the at the top of the meeting, but uh, how did we go from having such a surplus now to a deficit in a short amount of time? And you were talking about market issues. Uh, I don't know if you want to just reiterate that uh, briefly, and then yeah. Peter can always go and watch the the head of the meeting again. Yeah, no, we are we are. There's a lot of articles written about this, and and um, I encourage you to read them. Uh, but it, but. Our budget is much more susceptible to, uh, to its, its fluctuations. It's just the way that we, it's the way that we, um, uh, uh, it, it's, the, it's the way our tax system works. Um, we, we, we're so reliant on capital gains. We have actually a relatively low property tax because of Prop 13. Um, and so we end up being so subject to we're, we're much more reliant on capital gains on on income on, on a couple of other things that are uh that, that that really do track the market and we know of course the market's volatile 
Um, and that's a reason why there's all this fluctuation. It's part of why it was so important for us to create the reserve fund model, which didn't exist before. I mean, this is the crazy thing. Until Jerry Brown um, insisted upon it because of all of the disasters, financial and otherwise, that we'd had over the years, this simply didn't exist. So I remember serving on the school board, at, you know, after the in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 uh, collapse of the market, and it was awful. I mean, we were basically spending our entire time on the board trying to keep the lights on, keep the program strong, but balance our budget with much less money, trying to find local revenues. I mean, it was just a terrible experience in some respects, and it's because of the, the lack of, uh, because of the fact that our our system didn't adequately reflect the um, the, the 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 volatility of its revenue streams and and the impact that that was having on, on all of the programs that got funding from the state so um so that's why we did the rainy day fund that's why we built this massive reserve uh, as i say i think it should have been stronger but still it was the biggest we've ever had it, it it broke records and you know and the governor did put in more money into the reserves than he had to so i appreciate that um and, and you know, and some of us in the legislature were asking for more, and I think that helped to, to you know create the space for him to do so. Uh, and you know, I, that's that. I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a. We are in this. We all know the market is is volatile, right? I mean, look, all you got to do is just look at a chart. I was looking at the newspaper this morning of a chart of of the of the S and P five hundred over the last five years, and it's gone up and down and up and down, largely up, but it's had it's certainly gone down this year. And that's why we're in the deficit right now. I mean, pretty. I mean, that is there. There's there's more complexity to that that answer. But but you know, for the purposes of this of this of this event, it, it's 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 actually pretty accurate. Um, the market's been down. That's why we're in a contraction budgetarily, and uh, it's why, as I say, it's why having the uh, having that 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 rainy day fund was so important. Let me, uh, I, I don't mean to go totally third rail on you here, but I read an article yesterday um, where 200 um, millionaires were petitioning at Davos saying we should be taxed more, you know, uh, at, you know, at, because of the, the status that we have been able to attain, you know, uh, we, we don't typically, we, we typically think about that conversation in light of, you know, the federal government, you know, but yeah. has, have we talked about that or thought about that are, are are is the state legislature being petitioned in the same way by you know the millionaires here in the state of california to well it's a great question christian um it's a complicated question for this reason so it was that you 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 correctly so this first of all is davos an international conference you mentioned how it's federal the challenge we have is that it's so easy for people to move their money around these days that if you and I think this is this, you know, you saw this come up in the context of the debate over Prop 30 that was on the ballot this last time. We could all agree, we, you know, everyone knew that they wanted to have more revenue to help uh, fund a lot of the green energy uh, and electrification projects that were um, that, that we envisioned so as to meet our climate goals. Um, and of course, this was a tax that was proposed for the, the highest income earners. Interestingly, Gavin Newsom came out against it, even though a lot of the progressive infrastructure, the part, the California Democratic Party and others were out there, uh, uh, you know, supporting it strongly, the environmental community, et cetera. I think what happened with Gavin was that he's so so. Remember, we're talking about the budget and we're talking about how reliant we are upon high uh, upon our wealthiest for our budget. Um, those people who have who made all this money especially in the tech sector during the last you know during during the down during the the covid crisis really their money helped to fuel that budget surplus that we had so many of the strong programs that we have as a state are largely funded off of the backs of those folks and i guess the challenge that we continue to have here is how do we make sure that we uh that we have a high enough tax rate for those folks that we're able to really take advantage of uh, of of their success so as to fund all of these important programs that fund everything from water infrastructure to social safety net to transportation to schools etc 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 but do so in a way that doesn't go so high that it incentivizes everyone to leave people leave all the time companies come and get started up here too you know i think you know everyone's always complaining about the levels of taxes in california um you know i would argue that maybe we found a decent balance right now uh, you know, because while we certainly do see 
billionaires leave all the time. We also see new startups happening here all the time. And people, part of what makes California so vibrant and vital is our system that allows for, that, that, that helps to, to engender and create all of these new next generation companies that generate a lot of wealth that we're then able to put into our system. Uh, but it is a tricky balance. It's a tricky balance. And if California becomes so uncompetitive for the highest income folks, for the highest wealth people vis-a-vis -vis other states, we really do risk this uh this 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 system that we've that we've created that that is helping to fund uh uh you know our, that, that, that really plays such a big role in funding our all of our state's needs and that's the tricky challenge here um if we could find a way to uh to 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 create I, I would love this to happen at the federal level and of course we really need the federal government to do more to go after people who tax evade I mean, one of the problems, you know, the, obviously, you know, some of the Republican folks have been going against Biden's, you know, call for more resources at the IRS. But really what he's trying to do is make sure that you and I, who are actually, you know, it, it, we're, the funny thing is almost, I would bet that almost everybody on this call right now is paying a much higher percentage of our, of our, of our real income and wealth and taxes than some of the wealthiest people, because they can lawyer up and find all the tricks in the trade to get out of paying uh, taxes. And those are the you know those people are paying so much less of their fair share oftentimes, but it takes enforcement, and that's part of why we need to fund the IRS, right? We we you know that's why I'm very supportive of of what Biden's calling for because in the end of the day, actually, that's going to result in you and I, regular people, middle class people, paying uh you know paying a, a, something that's closer to our fair share and having the wealthiest actually pay um, what they're supposed to be paying uh, for our system to work properly. So, um, and, and by the way, uh, you know, one of the things that was so frustrating about the last go around, um, you know, and, and I, you know, when, when, the, when, when the Republicans were in charge of, of, of the federal government the last time, uh, you know, when, when it was unified government, the fact that they decided to take away the, the state and local tax deduction, which was one of the, you know, which was something that, 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 that was such an important thing for Californians. I mean, so many people had planned around it, you know, the knowing that they could reasonably deduct their state and local tax uh so as to allow for um you know so it, it, you know so so as to, so basically to account for all the, the taxes that we we're playing locally so you could deduct that after your federal returns it was wild I mean you know I mean there's a lot of reasons to um there's a lot of reason why I'm a Democrat the one thing was I I certainly didn't think that you know by having a Republican Congress it would mean that my taxes would go up well that's exactly what happened when they got rid of that deduction uh and that's certainly something that I think has also harmed California's competitiveness for uh, for people who, 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 you know, who, who pay a lot in taxes. So these are, these are some of the challenges that we face when we, when we, when we ask that question, Christian, there are certainly folks out there who are pushing aggressively for, uh, for millionaires, billionaires, tax for increased tax. Prop 30 was one version of that, but there's others that are out there, um, that are, that are oftentimes being pushed. Um, and I think it's a very compelling and, and attractive thing for people to, to get behind. Um, but I will say, that we got to be careful not to, not to, uh, you know, to, to to keep that balance in terms of this golden goose, which is you know our our our, our high wealth folks that that really are paying such a such a massive portion of the state's budget uh, revenue because of how progressive how much more progressive our tax system is than in other places, and that's the that's the balance that's the challenge I think that that we that we face right now on this question. Great. I, I, let me segue to a comment that your uh, staffer Davis put in here that you guys are hosting a tax preparation webinar on February 1st to discuss the major changes you should be aware of when you file your 2022 tax return. Uh, it's in the uh, chat so anybody can link and uh, link to that and sign up and uh, and I'll make sure when this live streams out that I put it in the uh, in the chat uh, there as well so people are aware of it um, and Davis if you have any uh, any information or you know kind of social media stuff on that just uh, please share it with me and i'll make sure we push it out there to the residents um all right so you've got about seven minutes before you've got to hop off so uh let me just see if there's any other uh questions in the chat uh do do uh Peter's just talking about CEQA being used to block affordability for students. He's absolutely right, and we need to. And there's there's definitely going to be some work um, to 
make sure that CEQA, I think that, that that recent Berkeley decision was wild. I mean, just yeah. really kind of crazy. And, um, and, and in fact, you know, Dan Walters uh, wrote a pretty, you know, a pretty compelling piece about it that I commend to you if you haven't read it yet, Peter. Um, and for those people who are, CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act, and, and it is, it comes into play anytime there is, you know, projects, development, uh, anything that, that may affect, you know, uh, the, the local entities where, where a project is happening of any scope. As long as the local entity is making a, a discretionary decision, if it's a ministerial decision, it doesn't right it doesn't kick in um but um but you know they they i you know i'm someone who who strongly believes in sequa um but i really wanted to get back to its environmental quality roots that that, that, that be at the heart of of the sequel analysis and unfortunately it's been used by a lot of people uh, you know whether it's a union trying to you know get a project labor agreement or one developer trying to mess with another or you want I, there's just a lot of um you know examples of 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 where it's 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 you know getting straying from its environmental quality roots and um so yeah peter says we're an hoa situation so that that's absolutely right so there, anyway there there i know that that that, that scott weiner is actually working on a on a on an issue on, on something directly relating to the berkeley situation because that the berkeley situation is a great example here we have a high density area you got a campus there and um you, you know we need to you know the university has a sacred uh you know, responsibility to, um, you know, provide more, 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 more seats to California students. It was part of the compact that was just signed with the governor. And that involves making sure that the students have a place to live when in near campus, uh, when they go, you know, when, when, when they, when they go to Berkeley. And, um, and so that's, that's a, that's, that's one of the many, many, many things happening on that front. Yeah, not complicated at all. Um, Kelly asks, how does one deal with the fact that 50% of the nation's homeless are living in California? Yeah, gosh. Uh, now, you know, so much of that, of course, has to do with our weather, quite frankly. Um, you know, we, we've, we've, it's just such a better place to be on the streets, you know, given our weather than, than in you know, colder parts of the country. Um, nobody wants to get rid of the good weather, but, but, you know, the question then becomes, how do we really make sure that we've got um, a better system? Um, so it's everything from, I mean, so there's so many layers to this. And, and Ben, we should point out too, it's, it is that, but it's also that we, uh, we have an enormous population in this state, uh, you know, with that, yes. which people seem to forget, you know, and, uh, and the fact that is that, uh, more and more people are falling into homelessness on a daily basis going back to some of the previous things we've yes. talked about the affordability crisis right uh, the house no question about that there's no question about that I mean, so so there is a there is an absolute uh, uh, there's a discernible uh, major portion of the homeless population that is on the streets today because they were just not able to afford to live uh in our communities because the costs are so high and you know you basically you lose your, you know, maybe you miss a rent payment, you get evicted. Next thing you know, you're living in your car. You know that. You know, and by the way, once you're in that situation, it's so much harder to get to work on time and you know showing up cleanly and and ready to work and being rested enough to work. Next thing you know, maybe they lose. You know, maybe maybe their boss is annoyed with them, cuts back their hours, then they miss their car payment, then their car gets re uh, repossessed, and now they're on the streets. And and so it's just this downward spiral that happens, you know, countless times. So, so, so the the housing availability question is massive, and it really does. There's a trickle down impact, and I, you know, and I think it is part of why, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's part. It is part of why there is such a push on housing availability, uh, and it really is directly tied into people's concerns about ensuring that there's enough availability. And and someone just mentioned about how not enough public housing was 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 built, and it's part of why we're trying to get Article 34 taken out of the Constitution, which makes it harder for public housing to be built. Uh, so all of those things make a big difference uh, uh, in 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 our in our in our, house, in our homelessness challenge. Um, so th that's why there's all that work happening on those things. But I also think we need to do more to identify people when they're at risk of of getting evicted. You know, one of the best ways to find out is when people start missing utility bills. And so if we could figure out, and, and unfortunately there's all these privacy concerns. But if but I, I from my perspective, we really ought to figure out a way to get around those privacy concerns in a way that could help to alert uh, you know, counselors and social workers when someone starts missing their utility bills so that they can get 
So we can have a rapid response that goes to that family, goes to that person and says, hey, you know, you may be under economic duress. What can we do to get you back on track so that you're not out on the streets or not in your car? Get those bills paid, maybe get some 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 relief uh, so as to get you back on track. And, and that's that's kind of the that, so that that's that's a that's certainly part of the story, too. Um, you know, we, we certainly have. Uh, we, we've you know, we've dramatically increased funding for homeless services, and there's going to be a lot of money that the homeless services or agencies and organizations out out there have. Uh, you know that, and, and so the, so so that's going to be everything from providing more resources for things like Project Home Key, um, for 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 programs like Share, for the Tiny Home Program that you do in Redondo Beach. That's fantastic, and if, if you know, and and maybe Christian, maybe one of your last things to do. Would be to, to bring your group, you know, bring the folks who participate in your town halls to tour. I, mean, I don't know, maybe you've done it already. I don't know, but to bring them there to see that, I think it's an exciting thing to see to see the homeless court that you have in Redondo as well. Um, you know, th those are all those are all really good programs. I went to go see a fantastic program not too long ago called Share, uh, S H A R E with an exclamation point. It's a it's an acronym for something, but but it, but it also reflects the fact that it's based on sharing. Uh, you know, th th there's something. The majority of homeless people don't want to go into a shared housing situation, but something like a third of all homeless people are actually okay with going to a, a shared housing situation. And this program takes advantage of the fact that while there's very low vacancy amongst multifamily unit dwellings in the region, you know, a lot of the homeless research is based on the New York model, where, where and of course, the New York housing stock is so based on, it's, 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 so, dom it's so dominated by multifamily units. Whereas in LA, it's dominated by single family homes. And this program takes advantage of the fact that there's actually an 18% vacancy rate am among the single family homes that are on the rental market. And you're able to pay the landlords a little bit over market because you're able to cobble together everyone's SSI payments. If you put six people in a three bedroom apartment, and when they actually share space, they're much more likely to truly share space. Sometimes when people are in their own apartments, they shut the door and they're up there. A lot of times that that's a good way to get someone back on track. But sometimes they're shutting the door and engaging in some of the same dangerous behavior that got them on the streets in the first place. You know, when you when you put people in a nice single family home in a neighborhood, first of all, it's not that much of an impact on the neighborhood because there's only six people living there and they all have a home. But they're actually much more likely to share the kitchen and the backyard and the living room. You know, they, they have Wi-Fi, they help people get involved in therapy networks like AA and NA and all those kinds of programs. And that's a really cool program that I really recommend, you know, uh, people to take a look at and get involved with. Um, you know, there's, there's this homeless services infrastructure that I think is poo-pooed uh, shared housing. And that's because it's based on this idea that we're just mass housing people in these kind of refugee camps. And that's not, by the way, that's an important interim step, I think, actually, to get people into safe places, at least, where they're able to get supportive services and security and counseling and all that kind of thing. But that's not a long-term solution. It's not even a medium-term solution. It's a short-term solution. Getting them into reasonable shared housing that takes advantage of our um, of our single-family home stock in Southland, I think, is a really good idea. And I, I would commend people to uh, to that program if you want to check it out. Yeah, and we also have uh, through the South Bay City Council of Governments, we've been doing the uh, home share uh, program as well, where individuals who maybe have extra rooms in their house, uh, and you know, especially people on fixed incomes, but you know, where they can bring somebody in, and a lot of times in a preventative manner, right? Going yeah. back to that, like somebody who has fallen into a, a state where they can't live on their own anymore, you know, and so uh, yes, I, I totally agree that that is a uh, um, a, a great program to focus on. So listen, I know you got to go. Uh, I, I appreciate you being here, especially with uh, the little one running around in the background. Um, uh, thank you so much again for your time and your service. And uh, uh, as I said, everyone, the contact information for Senator Allen's office is in the chat. We'll put that in uh, the social media threads as well, just so everybody knows uh, they do care about constituent services. And so please reach out to them anytime you have an issue with state issues. Uh, Senator Allen, thank you so much for thank being here. Thank you. Thanks so much. And maybe Davis and Sam can stick on for at least a few more minutes, but I got it. I got it. I'm taking no, no. my time somewhere right now. So no, thank, I know. You guys. thank you. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you, Christian. All right. We'll see you soon. Okay. Uh, all right. So we have, uh, we have about uh, 30 more minutes of the meeting here and we can just uh, open it up to, uh, of course, as always, uh, any other questions related to local matters or things you guys want to talk about or uh, have concerns about and uh, 
so I will open up the floor. Feel free to raise your hand. And uh, I'm not seeing. Okay, uh, Margaret. Um, I just want to say that I'm very pleased that the council decision went the right way the other day. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Because I agree with what Senator Allen said about your, you know, your commitment to community, you know, involvement and and you've been responsive to things that I've brought to you on occasion. And, uh, you know, I don't think we could have had a better representative. So I'm really happy it went that way. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I want to, you know, again, uh, thank everyone who sent an email or showed up or, uh, either in person or on Zoom. I'm, I'm super grateful for that. I want to just throw a, a, a special shout out here to uh, Bob Wolf, who's on this call. He sent a seven page uh, letter that I, I think was um, extremely compelling from a legal perspective. And uh, and so uh, I shared that on social media. And uh, Bob, I, I'm very appreciative of you taking time out of your day to even you know send something like that to the city council. Um, okay. back, at, back at you, Christian. Uh, I second what Ben said. I don't live in Redondo Beach, but you are just a regional treasure um, for your very broad perspective about uh, the needs of the South Bay. And it's greatly appreciated. I got. I have to be up in Venice at eleven. But uh, thanks again for the up for uh, for all your all these meetings and and for everything that you've done. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. Um, okay, uh, Kelly. Question says: When the bus station gets completed at Kingsdale, how does the city control the homeless population from living there? Um, well. You know, Kelly, our strategies here locally in Redondo aren't going to change, right? Um, we continue to get individuals off the street on a on a daily basis. Um, you know, we've made steps here. You know, with both contracting out to uh, to Harbor Interfaith and and other providers to help us in that matter, we brought um, the person that was working for Harbor Interfaith into the city. She's now a city employee. Uh, and that's her job. As a matter of fact, I saw a Facebook post from her the other day where, you know, she's always sharing on Facebook her, you know, the successes and, you know, the stories of, of what she deals with on a daily basis. And the other day, like, uh, you know, a gift from heaven, she, I think she got, she said six to eight people off the street in one day, thanks to like, you know, something that just happened, you know, like that something came, became available and she was able to do it. And I will say it's, it's really challenging um you know it's not just challenging to get individuals off the street you know when they are uh reticent to to do that it's challenging because at times we don't have places to get people into you know uh whether that's a shared housing scenario uh, a place like our um our, our tiny homes you know uh, things that have true wraparound services so um the good thing is is that you know redondo has definitely been a leader in this area in uh, the past four or five years and um and as a result we are seeing uh great results with the individuals who have resided here as unhoused individuals in redondo um naturally you know there's a lot of uh, fluidity in the south bay you know individuals may bed down in torrens but they come into redondo for uh for services or vice versa you know the other way around so um my, my goal has always been to ensure that our sister cities that surround us are doing uh, the same and and uh, and I think that is starting to pay off you know we've seen Torrance now take a, a much more heightened approach in this they've they've created their own tiny homes uh, scenario um, Manhattan Beach hasn't quite gotten there yet but they're uh, they definitely are seemingly moving in the right direction Hermosa Beach has joined with us uh, and is now doing uh, the the homeless court program which uh you know is basically uh using the law as an incentive to help people uh, change their lives and then you know eventually get housing ready and that's another you know challenging thing that should be brought up you know um, a lot of individuals who live on the streets are not housing ready 
Uh, what does that mean, right? It sounds like, oh, they're not ready to go into some type of home. It's, it's actually complicated. If you don't have a driver's license, if you have a record, you know, uh, there are so many hurdles to overcome for somebody to be able to get into housing. Uh, and so we're focused, you know, both at the city level and at the, uh, at the sub-regional level on this, uh, this complicated issue. And, you know, Ronson, who's on the call with the South Bay Cog, you know, he works in partnership. You know, he's a resident here in Redondo Beach, but he works for the Cog uh, in this area. And, uh, you know, it, it's a big team effort. Everybody is trying to do the best they can. So to your point, you know, do I think that um, our homeless situation is going to increase at the transit center? I don't think it's going to increase any more than it already has, uh, that, that, that already exists as a result of transit coming through that area. Because what happens right now is that if there are unhoused individuals on the buses, they're just getting off uh, at 182nd and, uh, and Hawthorne where the buses let everybody out. Um, so, you know, whether they go another couple blocks and get off, uh, it's not gonna change the situation. But what's, what's good is that if that is the case and they want to get back on a bus and go to another destination, the transit center will make a, it's a one-stop area for people to get on and or off buses. Uh, and keep going. I'm not particularly worried about um, uh, about there being uh, any issues. Uh, you know, part of our uh, part of our solutions and and our process here is also to ensure public safety and quality of life. And so there will be 24-hour security presence at the um, uh, at the transit center, and of course our police department and our quality of life people and and people like Lila. Uh, will be also, you know, continuing to outreach and, and help anybody that needs it, regardless of where they are. Um, Laura is asking if there's a way to observe homeless court. Um, and yes, so I can, uh, I can share uh, uh, the information related to Lila. A lot of people are starting to follow Lila Omora Garcia on Facebook um, because they're they're just interested in this so i can uh, share that with you laura um and yes if anybody can come observe homeless court um right now it's happening um nine times a year it happens monthly uh usually in the i want to say the third wednesday of the month and ronson you can jump in if anything has changed um it's happening nine times a year in redondo and now three times a year in hermosa um, where we do it in Redondo is um, right behind uh, the special units uh, police area. It's, uh, it's on the Redondo Beach uh, uh, high school site. It's at the corner of uh, Vincent and uh, PCH. Uh, there are 200 PCH. There's a building there that, that uh, our special investigation units and stuff use for the police department. And we have a whole section in the parking lot that's gated and uh, and that's where homeless court happens here in Redondo. Uh, I'm not sure where it's happening in Hermosa at this time, but uh, but I can also send out information, anybody who's interested, so I can send that to you, Laura. Uh, let me see. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Laura, go ahead. Just got to unmute. Yeah. Um, when are you going to let us know what your endorsements are for the coming election? Yes, I am. I, uh, you know, I'm probably, uh, I was actually just talking with the city attorney about this because I, I do want to uh, send that out. And, uh, you know, I was like, do I need to not do it from the email that I usually send out my e blast? And I think his recommendation was yes. So, I'm going to figure out how to get that information out there. I'll put up a blog post, um, and uh, and I will share my my thoughts on uh, on the uh, the district three race to replace me, uh, the treasurer race, um, and then there is also a school board race. Uh, so I will I will put that information out there for everyone. And of course, anybody can um, can email me or contact me uh, offline as well anytime, and I'm happy to share my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, anyone else? All 
All right. Well, you're all quiet. <laughs> you're still full from uh, from the holiday meals. Uh, okay. So uh, so here's what uh, will happen. We we will. Uh, my plan is to do a February and a March community meeting. Uh, I don't know what the topics will be or uh, who our special guests will be, uh, but uh, I will do those last two and then. Um, uh, maybe in March, you know, uh, I will invite whoever wins that election to also come on and, uh, you know, try to pass the torch uh, to to them. So uh, I guess we will end a little bit early today. And I just want to say thank you again to everyone uh, for being here, taking time out of your Saturday morning. And uh, and of course, thank you to everyone who participated uh, at the special meeting this past week. I'm truly grateful. And, uh, and glad to be able to finish out the last uh, two months here. So uh, with that said, we'll see you guys all uh, next month. Take care. Thank you very much, Christian. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, Christian. You're welcome, Bob.